Have you just forked out 500 bucks on the latest model GoPro, inspired by your favorite moto vlogger or mountain bike YouTuber or whoever it is that you watch, only to get your footage back onto your computer and find that it looks like you strap grandma's old telephone to your forehead and it sounds like you're riding in a tornado? You're not the only one. Here's how to fix it. Alright, first it'd probably be prudent to explain to you guys a little bit about camera company psychology. I've had heaps of Sony cameras, Canon, Nikon, Panasonic, GoPro are no different, they're all the same. Basically, they're allowed to make good cameras and promote incredible looking footage from them and all the rest of it, but before they sell it to you, they seem to have some sort of agreement between them all, where they set them to the worst possible settings before they go to the consumer. And so you get your camera, you don't have a degree in cameras, you're just going to get terrible footage from it. Um, and that's pretty much what I'm here to help you guys with because I actually understand what the settings do and can tell you how to set them up properly so that you can get the best out of your camera. But bottom line is no camera is going to look good out of the box. And same goes for TVs and anything. They just, I, I don't know why, they make good products and then just totally f*** them before they sell them to you. And that just seems to be the way they do things. So yeah, let's rectify GoPro's terrible setup of their stock cameras. Right, so what I've got here is just a bog standard GoPro Hero 8. I like the Hero 8 because it's got all the features I need. It can do 4K 25 in super view with hyper smooth and 25 frames per second in 4K is really my maximum frame rate because it's all my other cameras can do, so I don't need to go any higher than that. The 10 can actually do double that, which would be down the line probably an upgrade I'll look at, but for now the Hero 8 does everything I want. And I went for the Hero 8 over the Hero 7, which is an extremely good deal and essentially exactly the same camera as this because 8s have the built-in mounting point at the bottom so you don't have to bother with any kind of a case, which is just extra hassle in my opinion. So I like the Hero 8. But this video is not really about which GoPro model you should buy, that's up to you to research. I'm just going to tell you how to set them up in order to get the best out of them for POV, motocross, mountain biking, road biking, stock cars, whatever it is you want to use them for. Anything that's got a full face helmet, this video is going to apply to that. Right, let's dive into the settings. So I've set the camera back to its default setting right here and I want you to go into video mode obviously and then into cinematic. Click the little pencil beside the cinematic and we'll go in here and set the settings up. So, 4K 25, that's actually what I want this at. Now, the reason mine's 25 and not 30 is because I've got this set up for a PAL region, which is what I live in. Pretty much US, Mexico, Japan, and China, I think South Korea as well, or NTSC, everything else is PAL. And so PAL is 25 and 50 frames a second, NTSC is 30 and 60. And the reason you want those set for your region is because if you shoot indoors, on the wrong one, the lights will flicker. And you've probably seen that before in amateur video or even on some of your own clips. So do a quick Google of PAL and NTSC, see what region you're in and set your camera for that. I think on GoPros it's called flicker reduction, not NTSC slash PAL, but yeah, 50 hertz for New Zealand, Australia, UK, pretty much the whole world, 60 hertz for America, like I said. Lens, I run this in super view. Now what Superview does is gets a 4-3 aspect ratio image, which is pretty much square. You remember how the old TVs used to be square compared to how the new 16x9 ones are? Superview shoots in a 4-3 aspect ratio, so you get a lot of vertical field of view. You can see a lot up and down as well as the normal amount side to side. And then what it does is puts an artificial gradient stretch on it, which slowly stretches the image more and more and more till the edges of the frame and it fully stretches it out to get a 16 by 9 frame like today's TVs are, which does give you some false sizing on the side of the image, like if there's someone stood in the side of the shot they'll look real fat, um, which is not great. But the advantage, especially with something like mountain biking or motocross, is the extra vertical resolution you get from running super view means you can get the handlebars in the shot and then still see the horizon so you're not getting dizzy while you're trying to watch it. It's a really good setting for point of view footage, so definitely I like that on super view. All right, hyper smooth, you got three settings here, off, on, and boost. Now, the more hyper smooth you have on, the more it's gonna crop the image and sort of allow it 
free play to move around the sensor. The less sensor you're using, the worse your image is gonna look basically, and also the less field of view you're gonna get. So if you've got that on boost, it's just gonna crop the image a bit too much and kind of defeat the purpose of having it on super view in the first place. So I like to run this on on, and trust me, with it set to on, there's no lack of smoothness. I've never ever thought my footage was shaky. Off, it definitely is shaky, so you want this on. Bitrate, you want this set to high. Um, this will give you bigger file sizes, but what it will do for your image quality is get rid of that blockiness that you sometimes get in the corners when you're moving fast through things like trees and there's a lot happening in the image. You really need a high bitrate in order to pull that off. It might mean you need to get a bigger SD card. Um, I would think 128 would do the trick. I actually personally use 256 gigabytes, but as you guys know, we do a hell of a lot of filming and often film all day long. And just for reference, I've never run one of those out or even really come that close to it. So 256 gig is plenty. And those cards are actually not as expensive as you'd think they would be. So yeah, moving on. Shutter speed, just leave that on auto. That's how GoPros expose. They don't have an aperture, so they expose with their shutter speed. That needs to be on auto or else it's just never gonna work anywhere where there's differing light. Like for example, if you're going in and out of trees, if you're going indoor and outdoor, anything like that, shutter speed, auto. The only place I'd ever use shutter speed on manual, and even then I probably still wouldn't use it on manual, would be in somewhere like a desert where you're just not gonna have any change in light. That's up to you guys, but for me, shutter speed, auto, you're never gonna get yourself in trouble with it set to that. EV comp. Now this is the target exposure that the GoPro aims for. In theory, zero should be true to your eye, but I find in my experience, zero tends to be a little bit overexposed. So I run this on negative one, and that is a real good setting that prevents you from getting overexposure in any of your shots. And if any do come out a bit underexposed, you can just bring them up and post. It's a bit more difficult to save an overexposed shot as opposed to an underexposed shot. So yeah, err on the side of caution, negative one on EV comp. Right, white balance. This is essentially like the warmness or coolness of the image. 5500K is the standard setting for sunlight and I run that in every scenario across all of my cameras. That just makes life so much easier. White balance is just another thing to worry about. I lock it to daytime mode and if it ends up looking too warm or too cool in non-daylight, I can just color grade it and post and fix that, but I seldom have to do that. I think the sunlight setting on any camera looks good in all situations. And on GoPros, that's 5500K. So that's what I recommend you set your white balance to. Just a brief explanation on what ISO is, it's kind of like false light that the camera can pump into an image and having anything above minimum will start to introduce gradually as you go more and more noise into the image, which is those sort of funny colored pixels and the image looks like grainy is the word people use to describe it. So ISO minimum, you definitely want that on 100 so that when your GoPro can, it will go down to the minimum ISO that it can and ISO max, which means the setting that it will go up to whenever you go into like nighttime shooting, a, a dark forest, a dark room, whatever, the maximum you ever want it to go to, in my opinion, even if you're shooting in the pitch black of night, is 400. That is an image that won't be too crazy grainy and you'd be surprised at how much brightness it can still achieve with 400 ISO. Beyond that, you're just gonna get a really, really odd looking image, even if you're shooting at night, you still want it to look like what your eyes are seeing and beyond 400 ISO, it just looks weird. Like weird is the best way to describe it. So you don't want it going any higher than that in my opinion. 400 ISO max, 100 minimum. Sharpness, now this is a big one. All cameras, TVs, monitors, everything comes with the sharpness turned on and it never, ever, ever makes anything look better. Turn this to the minimum setting immediately. On any camera, any TV, any monitor, it looks horrid. Color, this has two options. It's either gonna be GoPro or flat. I run mine on flat because I touch the colors up in my editing software and make them look how I want them to look, to, normally to match the other cameras more than to make it look better necessarily. Flat I find is still very colorful and has a lot of saturation in it, but if you're someone who just totally doesn't know what to do with color and you're never gonna to touch it, I'd set this to GoPro, but yeah, if you're shooting with other cameras and you know how to color grade or you wanna learn how to do that, run this on flat, just gives you a bit more freedom. 
raw audio. So what this setting will do is record a separate audio track to the one that the GoPro records with the footage, which is untouched. The actual audio that you get on your clip from your GoPro has a massive amount of filtering done to it by the camera itself. And in my opinion, it's actually pretty good filtering. So I just leave this setting off. To be fair, I haven't really experimented with it. Maybe it is worth mucking around with and it's probably something I'll get to in the future. But for now, I just run raw audio off. Wind filter on, just leave that on. We're gonna do a mod later on to get rid of the wind noise because as it is now, the wind noise is just gonna be shocking regardless of whether you have this setting on or not. But leave it on, it does help. Even after we've done the mod, just get rid of any little rumblings that the wind might cause. And shortcuts, I'm not gonna tell you how to set those up. That's just personal preference where you want things for convenience sake. But the bottom line is your footage should now look more like this. Unfortunately though, it's gonna sound like this. Here's how to fix that. So the only thing you're gonna need to buy for this is a mic sock and then some double-sided tape. Otherwise you just need scissors and a knife. The mic sock I just bought from literally the closest music shop to my house for five bucks. I'm sure if you were willing to wait on AliExpress shipping though, you could probably pick one up for just a matter of cents and the double-sided tape you can just find anywhere. Ideally, you want the stickiest stuff possible, but what I'm using here isn't anything special. It was just what I had lying around at the time that I decided to try this. Start by cutting a 10 by 10 by 20 millimeter-ish chunk out of the mic sock. As you can see at this point, mine's less of a sock than a cap. I've mutilated it that much over the years. But once you've got that ready, chop a roughly 10 by 20 piece of double-sided tape off and stick it right centrally over the top of these nine holes on the front of your GoPro. Then grab your knife and carefully cut around and remove the square covering the mic holes. This can be a bit finicky and doesn't have to be super precise, but just muck around with it until you get it. After a few tries, it becomes pretty easy. Then grab the scissors again and square off the side of the foam that you're going to stick onto the double-sided tape and press it on hard. That's mic number one, done. Now just rinse and repeat over the single mic hole on the left hand side of the GoPro, but this time with a 10 by 10 by 10 ish piece of foam, and of course a 10 by 10 piece of double sided tape as well. And if you're wondering why we're not covering those bigger rectangle holes, they're just drainage outlets for any water that might find its way into the mic channels, so leave those uncovered. And job done. I just like to give them a little haircut now so that they look a bit slicker because there's no getting around the fact that you've just stuck a moustache and a single sideburn onto your GoPro. But that's it. You'll be astonished at the difference that makes. But do keep in mind that this mod falls apart somewhat in the heavy rain because the foam just fills up with water and muffles the microphones which results in audio like this. which is terrible as well, but actually isn't any worse than the wind noise from before. So yeah, heavy rain's something I've yet to crack with these cameras, but the foam performs fine in lighter drizzle. So that'll get you most of the way there. Holy that out already. But there's another half to this equation, which is where you mount the GoPro. Obviously back in the day, everyone used to run it when they first came out on top of their helmets, which is okay but you can't really see the bike in the bottom of the shot and it's pretty high everything kind of looks quite mundane from that perspective then as we evolved and we learned we started mounting it underneath the peak which is actually quite a good angle but the problem is it tends to get the peak in the top of the shot and is still a bit higher which gives you more visibility in the footage and kind of makes you look like you're riding a bit slow because you can see more in the footage than you actually could when you were riding in real life the best one we've learned after a lot of testing is on the end of the mouthpiece now this is nothing new I'm not the only one doing this and I wasn't the first to do it it's been around for a while and there are multiple ways to mount it here but I just wanted to talk about the advantages of doing so before I begin for starters I think this is the most true to life angle you can get it's almost in line with where your eyes are looking and in fact it's actually a bit lower than them which means it captures more of the bike in the bottom of the shot so you can see what that's doing on the footage 
The other advantage is it's not on top of your helmet or on the side or anything like that, so it's not gonna get ripped off by a tree or anything when you're doing enduro or things like that. And the third one, which is quite a big one, is it picks up what you say when you talk because it's right in front of your mouth. <laughs> Mate, that's, <laughs> that's not hard enough. You can actually get aftermarket mics if you want to be a moto vlogger or whatever and they pick up your voice really well, but the problem is the minute you start blowing hard when you're racing or whatever, you start to sound like Darth Vader, whereas with the stock one with this mod we've done, it doesn't pick up your breathing, but if you talk loudly, it will actually pick up your voice really well, which is great. So that's why we mount it to the front of the helmet. And there are a few ways that you can do this. You would have probably seen before people with those massive ugly clamps. I'm sure they work perfectly well. And if you're happy to have that on your helmet, then more strength to you. But for me, doing videos like I do, that's just way too ugly in my opinion. So we had to come up with a solution that was a bit better looking. The best actual product that you can go out and buy for this, in my opinion, is the Pro Shop mount. Their website's www.proshopcam.com. They've been a great friend to the channel over the years, and they make an excellent product. So it's held onto your helmet with this stuff, which is called 3M Dual Lock Adhesive, but all that's for sale here in New Zealand is the Scotch alternative. It's like Velcro, but it's hard plastic spikes that lock into each other. They kind of have like a mushroom shape to them, and like the heads kind of lock behind each other. And it really like, once it's on there, it's on there. You wouldn't think this would hold very well, but trust me, once they're on there, they're on there. A while ago, it pretty much fit every helmet, but nowadays with helmet design getting more and more elaborate like it is, you'll see that this Shoei VFXW has a ridge right along where you would want to put the dual lock adhesive. So it doesn't really work for this helmet. And my mate Kynan's Liat one, it wasn't going to work for his either. That has big vents where you want to mount it. And I think a lot of helmets are sort of going that direction to where this mount just doesn't work with them anymore. So lately I've had to come up with some more radical solutions. And it's not actually as hard as you'd think. I've got a big drawer full of old GoPro bits that I've collected over the years. And probably a lot of you watching will have something similar. Dig in there and see if you can come up with anything. Like for example this, it's half of a handlebar clamp mount zip tied to the structural bit in the front of the showy and I've obviously taken the mouthpiece off and it's got me a nice solid mount down here that I can set my camera on and get a good angle. With Kynan's Liat I was able to zip tie the camera mounting point from a head strap. I just cut the strap off the head strap and zip tied that to the front. His one's actually even sturdier. There are a couple of things you can learn from this though. For one I think I'm probably gonna have to do a version two of this at some stage here because that is actually not enough angle, not enough height. Um, you should really have it like if your head sat here, that's about where your head would naturally sit, right? When you're just riding along. You want it to be pretty much level with the horizon when it's like that. And as you can see how I've got it here with this little mount that I've made up, we're not quite getting enough height on that angle. So I'm, like I said, I'm probably gonna have to do a version two of that. I just couldn't figure out how to get the mount far enough out, but maybe you have better luck than I have. It just depends on what you got lying around and what helmet you have. Also, bit of a pro tip, getting the bolt hole on the right side, because you see with this Hero 8, the sevens are the same, and the nines and the tens are the same as well. I'm not sure about the fives and the sixes and below, but the battery door is on the right hand side of the GoPro here. And if your bolt's going in that same side, which is where it typically is on most mounts by design, which is kind of annoying, it's actually really difficult to get your battery door open and swap batteries on the fly um, with the bolt in the way. You, you normally have to take your helmet off and just battle with it for a while. So I've intentionally set this mount up so that the bolt goes in the other side. And now I can easily access my battery door and swap batteries on the fly. So look at that, but if you don't have any GoPro accessories lying around, maybe you need to look at making something up yourself if you're a bit of a handyman, or a Pro Shop mount. These are a little bit pricey, but worth it because they can mount to pretty much every helmet, except for the real new ones, which seem to be getting more and more radical designs and being a bit more difficult to mount to. So that's how to mount your GoPro, and that'll give you, in my opinion, the most realistic angle. Like, seriously, it looks like a first-person motocross video game. It's amazing. And with this mod that we did to the mics, you'll have no wind noise. And in theory, your GoPro footage should be just as good as mine. I'll play some for you now so you can see what that'll be like.
So there you go. That, in my opinion, is the best way to set up and mount your GoPro for motocross, cross country, enduro, hill climbing, downhill mountain biking, uphill mountain biking, go-karting, adventure riding, road biking, whatever it is that you do. If you've got a full face helmet and can improvise a bit where it doesn't apply for your helmet type or whatever, I think you can get the same quality of footage that I get, or if not, even better by following along correctly. I hope that's helped. I hope if you are regretting your purchase of a GoPro, that's reconciled it a wee bit. And if you're new, I hope that you'll stick around for more content to come. We try and post every Wednesday the highest quality content we can here on this YouTube channel. And in my opinion, some of it's pretty cool. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Say you ain't got the time I'm the last one you priority